All right, man, we are really excited about this. We've been uh, wanting to talk to Shad White for a while now, and uh, we don't agree on everything, but I'm still probably one of Shad's biggest supporters as well. And Shad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, hey, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. I have to tell you this real fast though. I um, I have three kids. I have a five year old, a three year old, and a one year old. And I've been, I've been looking forward to getting here. This morning, I was dropping off my kids, and my one year old, like as I'm dropping him off, put like snot and and some of the worst <laughs> stuff you've ever seen on this shirt right here, this white shirt. And so at that moment, I was like, all right. I have three options. I can I can go back home and change, and I will definitely be late for this show. <laughs> I could call and cancel, which would be really bad, or I could put this blazer on over all this stuff and show up, and I have elected for number three. So anyway, <laughs> th I, I'm coming in on two wheels and uh, – and grateful to be here but that's mornings in my house typically so that's why that's why it's been it's been hard to get here but i'm i'm grateful for the chance to come on but look man we're, we're grateful to have you and, and and before we get into the the mississippi swindle stuff and kind of unpacking all that i want to tell you just an extent a thank you for what you're doing to battle dei yeah in this state at yeah. our universities and I, I don't know that anybody else is doing it and willing to put themselves out there because you, the, the default setting anytime you want to argue this is, well, you must be a racist. And, you know, that's like the scarlet letter, right? Nobody yeah. wants to be tagged a racist. Yeah. It, it happens around here a lot. But um, I, I appreciate you fighting that fight and your fight with brain drain yeah. and all that. And if we can ever, you know, one of my passions is Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, it becoming a livable, safe, livable place. And I think that'll help with brain drain as well. You know, if young folks yeah. have a nice urban fun area, they, you know, to keep them to stay here. And uh, we, we need more of that. And I was actually in the, I went to Mississippi State game a few weeks ago and kind of somehow another finagled my way into the suites. And I was in the president's suite there and I look over, there, right? I look yeah, over and I see good. Sid Salter there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wanted to, I wanted to poke him a little bit so bad. But I was like, no, nah, you're a guest here. You know, don't, don't do it. <laughs> you're more diplomatic than I am, Clay Edwards. I never thought I would say that sentence, but uh, yeah, it's, thank you for saying that. Um, on the DEI thing, yeah, there's a lot of people who who shy away from telling the truth about what's happening with our taxpayer dollars at our universities. And I think one of the reasons is exactly what you said, that they don't want to be called a bad name. I think another reason, frankly, is that a lot of our politicians, uh, not only do they not want to be called racist, but they also don't want to jeopardize their free football tickets to our university games. I mean, I'm just speaking bluntly. Yeah, please do. Um, That's what we do around here. And so, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I, I view it as, well, I, I'll just say it this way. I think it's far more important to just tell the truth about everything. I, I think it's far more important to tell the truth and to try to keep somebody at a university happy uh, and, and simultaneously hide from the taxpayers what their money is going toward. And, and I also think that in the long run, if we keep just wasting money on this DEI garbage, it hurts our, our state and our economy. So an example from North Carolina is, you know, they just got rid of all their DEI programs at their universities. They eliminated 53 positions across several universities, saves about $17 million per year, according to their estimates. And they're putting that money back into campus police to actually make the universities better. And if we don't start doing that in Mississippi, those universities in those other states are going to serve as economic growth engines for their state. They're going to be powerhouses for their state, and we are going to get left in the dust. But because we've got a bunch of weak need people who won't talk about the truth about where our taxpayer money is going, we are not spending that money effectively. And so we've, we've got to keep calling it out until there's enough public pressure on these universities and lawmakers to actually change where this money is going so that our state can prosper. That's the goal at the end of it, I think, for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, and then you brought up a great point when this whole thing sort of kind of blew up with Sid Salter and stuff that that they they just changing the name on this. Stuff. Yes. Uh -huh. and, but the policies have remained the same and they're coming up with something, you know, less controversial. But, you know, what's funny is DEI. These are critical race, CRT. These are terms that they created. Yes. And then we started using them against them or just calling out the. The, the ridiculousness of them and they're like oh now you now they made like dei like it's a swear word uh-huh and, and uh, if you call uh, they came up with it they did. In, the, in the 70s they herbert marcusa was the the professor who came up with that Derek bell was the professor that came up with the term crt so so like we're using their words to describe the thing that they invented and just telling people what they're saying and, and apparently that's 
that's terrible. That's the worst thing in the world. But, but, you know, you're exactly right when you talk about masking the problem. So now they know the term DEI is toxic because we've told people what it actually means. And so now they're changing, the universities are changing the names of these programs to things like access opportunity and, and purple unicorns or something. They're using new words and, and they're, they're even admitting. So a spokesperson for the university of Southern Mississippi admitted to the newspaper that this was just a name change. We're not changing any of the substance of what we're doing. They said the quiet part out loud. And, and I wanted to pull them aside and say, you know, you're not supposed to, to tell the truth if you're trying to fib about this whole thing, right? You should probably just try to cover it up like you've been doing. So anyway, the, the point is that we as voters, as taxpayers, we have to be vigilant about watching this stuff. As state auditor, I cannot change any of these things. I can't tell a university what to do. I can't tell lawmakers what laws to pass but I can shine a light on where your taxpayer money is going and tell you about it and tell you the truth. And, and hopefully in the end, the truth wins out. That's the goal. Uh, I want to ask you another question. I'd be remiss if I didn't do this, because this is something I get a lot with my social media, a little off topic from DEI, Come but <clears throat> Chet, you do, a, you do such a great job holding uh, state employees accountable that get caught stealing money or state municipal employees, whatever. Why can't we? Can we explain to people? Because I think I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Why does it feel like nothing's being done to investigate all the shenanigans going on in Jackson? We we have gotten tons of tips in Jackson. Um, I think anybody knows from watching me that I am not shy about investigating any case at all, regardless of who it is, what the color of their skin is, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever. Um, the, the simple truth of the matter is we can only work with the evidence that we are given from whistleblowers and then the evidence that we dig up as a result of that. And so I would just say this in general, if there's any, if there's ever a situation where somebody says, well, why haven't you done something about that? Number one, we may have done something about it. We may have investigated it and a prosecutor has just not taken our case yet. That's possible. Right. And then number two, a lot of times when we go into a place and we start an investigation, we are reliant on people uh, being willing to tell the truth about some of their co-conspirators and what they've done. And if they are not willing to do that, we don't have a case. So that's that's the challenge. But for anybody who's out there who says, well, Shad White hadn't done anything on Jackson. Number one, we have investigated specific tips related to Jackson. And, and I'd, I'd ask them to tell me, why do you think I would be scared to go after Jackson? Huh. Like what possible reason would there be? I'm not like there, there's absolutely like no a plus reason. for you, right? He's there's there's no that, reason. Right? I, I can't speak to there's, there's no pluses <laughs> in a crime. Right. But, but there is no reason why I would not fully investigate any tip that we got related to Jackson. So, so what we've been told is that, so what I've been told by why, why stuff maybe not, may not get investigated in Jackson is that as state auditor, you can investigate, incorporated municipalities unless they ask you to come in is that true there's some truth to that here's the way i would say it we're not allowed under law to audit cities period that's that's clear in the statute there was a an attempt to change that in state law this past session and it died so we're not allowed to audit cities now if i get a specific tip in from somebody let's say you're a city employee in jackson and you say uh, Shad, I've got a tip related to sp a specific allegation of criminal activity in Jackson. We can take that specific tip and we can do a criminal investigation on that by itself, but we cannot do a general audit of Jackson. So what we do when it comes to any city is that anytime we get a specific tip in, we bear down, we go as hard as we possibly can. We have a great team at the auditor's office. They go as hard as they possibly can. That's why we've recovered more money in the last six years than any other six year period in the history of the state. Uh, but, but you, you can't, you, you can't guarantee that there's going to be a result at the end of it. We only do the investigating part. We don't do the prosecuting part. Cannot. Can't they, uh, they, they can invite you in, right? Didn't Chokeway invite you guys in to do one? Is that, I read that wrong? Or? Yeah. What was it? Maybe on the, uh, the benefits scandal, something. Or something to do with benefits. I thought, I thought, I thought you sent me something like that. Clay. He, uh, not, not to my knowledge, okay. no, not yeah. to my knowledge. Well, you then, know, so I would, there, yeah, there was a period yeah. when, uh, you probably remember all the stuff about the garbage contract, the mayor did ask us to uh, to look at 
one version of the garbage contract at one point. And so we had technical assistance staff answer a question for him about whether or not that specific version was legal or not. Okay. But that, Maybe that's that's the most specific request that I can recall us getting from. from I the think writer. that was what it was related yeah. to. I'm thinking uh, of. Yeah. Well, there, well, there was something, uh, not, not to get bogged down in the weeds sure. on, on what is, but there was, there was something a month or so ago where somebody in their, in their, their employee, a retirement benefits package or somebody found oh, a way yeah, to, that's right. to graze that. a little off the top or mm -hmm. something. And yeah, no, so. so that's, that's specific enough for uh, specific enough for us to look into. Absolutely. So if that gets forwarded to us, we can dig into that. Yep. Okay. Let, let's take our first break here uh, in this hour. We got state auditor Shad. What's our first break with Shad? Uh, we have Shad White here in the studio. We got a bunch of things we want to hit with him. We're going to get into uh, all the Brett Favre drama, the Mississippi swindle book and more. Hey, look, if y'all haven't read the book, it's the first whole book I've read front to back in a long time. And uh, I man, appreciate that. And I truly enjoyed it. I did. But, you know, but one of the things I want to get to in that is uh, it's something I've been harping a lot about on the show is what feels like an internal civil war between conservatives in this state and nationally. I want to get your take on that when we come back and more. We got Shad White and Sean Yurk around here on the Clay Edwards show. We'll be right back on the other side of this break. On Saturday, October 12th at Pearl City Park for the annual Oktoberfest and Gumbo Festival. That's right, Saturday, October 12th, 2024. There's going to be beer because you can't have an Oktoberfest without Clay and Sean. I mean beer. There's going to be live music, food, vendors. It's going to be a big old car show and a kid zone. Hey, you think you got what it takes to make some award-winning gumbo? Think you can win some money? Check this out. It's also their annual gumbo cook-off again, Saturday, October 12th at the City Park in Pearl. Main Street Pearl presents. Check out these cash prizes. First place is going to get $1,500. bucks. 2nd place, $1,000. 3rd place, $750. Think you can decorate your booth better than anybody else? How about a $250 prize for the most spirited decorated booth? Hey, Main Street Pearl is going to pick their favorite gumbo. If it's yours, there's $500 in your pocket. Again, join me and my co-host, Sean Yorkron, as we broadcast live from Oktoberfest in Pearl. Saturday, October 12th, the party starts at 10. Sean and I will be there sometime after lunch. We hope to see you there. What's the old saying? Don't meet me there, beat me there. 2024, Oktoberfest and Gumbo Festival, Pearl City Park, Saturday, October 12th. Stay blessed. Come back in to the Clay Edwards Show here live on WYAB. Guys, don't forget tonight, Burgers, Blues, Barbecue, downtown Brandon, Mississippi. It is the Cordless Corner. Week three of season two, your boy is a judge. Uh, the live entertainment starts at seven, but I'll be out there at five o'clock to 630 doing a live stream. You know, I've been bringing my, making the show mobile, going and setting up at businesses. And we've done it. This will be three weeks in a row. We've done it at Burgers, Blues, Barbecue. And again, we got a big box truck we're loading it full of bottled water and we got somebody that's willing to drive it to north carolina to Asheville, north carolina this friday they've got a back way in the roads washed out we got a call from some friends that have family there they need bottled water and gift cards if whichever one you're comfortable with if you can swing a 50 dollars gift card god bless you if you can swing a four dollar case of water god bless you drop it off there at burgers blues barbecue tonight if you want to uh, say hey to me get a picture anything like that would love to uh get to meet always love to get to meet my listeners and followers and whatnot so i'll be there from 5 p.m to i guess about 10 p.m tonight so please drop off a case of bottled water uh you got till friday at 4 p.m to drop off bottled water acme pizza and daiquiris on the res at fan and mart fan and lanes the 10 pin kingpin bowling alley right there on the other side of the reservoir you've got shuckers and pelican cove are all water drop off spots you got till friday 4 p.m but i hope to see you tonight burgers blues barbecue open mic competition cordless corner all right we got you're stuff. judging the open mic competition yeah you know shad in a in a previous life <laughs> i in a previous life i owned nightclubs and was a concert promoter yeah. uh, for about uh, 15 nice. years okay and i don't know that i don't know that that makes me the judge of talent by any means but they keep asking me to do these things I you think had to do a little of that that's fair you, you gotta know, figure out who's going on stage and who you know is going home well so something i got, I got to go down memory lane yesterday one of my all-time favorite bands has been broke up for about 15 years cross canadian ragweed and they've just announced that they're getting back together for one big show at the at the Oklahoma State football stadium. Hmm. And oh, wow. and everybody online is like all in a tizzy about it in a good way, you know. And I got to the line pretend I know who that is. I, just, I oh. have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I nodded, like, yeah, 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 yeah I can but, I could feel you doing that. Right? Like the, I didn't like say that. That, that yeah. kind of that red dirt country <laughs> yeah. kind of, you know, that Texas sound. Mm -hmm. And 
So they, I got to take a picture of the ticket that I, I, sa- I save everything. So I got a picture of my ticket and my, my, my working pass from that night. I was like, oh, it reminds me we were the first person to bring them to Mississippi kind of in their heyday. So they're getting back together and se- planning on selling out a football stadium. So they have their crowd. That's kind of cool. That's yeah, cool. So, so that, that was kind of my trip down memory lane yesterday. But I, anyway, I guess that's why they keep tabbing me to do these things. And I, and I, I don't like say it. no either. I like you it. You know, like some point I need to learn to say no. Right. But, uh, it's with, like Oasis. So the first CD I ever bought was What's the Story, Morning Glory by mm. Oasis. Oh, yeah. Sean knows what I'm talking yeah. about. And and they're getting back together after whatever, 20, oh, really? 25 years. They're doing a show at Wembley. I saw, well, I saw I the possible I leaked cities for the U.S. version of that Oh, tour. no way. Yeah, no so way. They are, they're going to be hitting, you know, the major, major markets. It's just yeah. like five or six markets. Yeah. I think they're going to do two nights each market. Okay. I just didn't realize the appetite for Oasis was – was double nights at a football stadium strong in America, but I guess us Gen, uh, Gen Xers, you know, early millennials are very excited about, you know, somebody, one oh, of the yeah. big groups from the nineties. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I was in eighth grade. That was the coolest thing ever was to go buy a CD. That was the first CD I ever bought. So <laughs> I, I can't afford tickets to whatever these shows are, but I'm, mm. but I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Yeah, oh, that yeah. was my like senior in high school. I, we walked to that song actually. I remember 97. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's, That's, That's cool. Yeah. Hi, right, um, Shad, uh, I'll take this first kind of question. I'll let Sean, uh, he's got several he wants to hit you with too. Um, so in the book, you, 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 you know, Mike Hurst came on here. You went pretty hard at Mike Hurst. I think his name's mentioned 120 some odd times in the book. <laughs> Not quite, but close. Yeah, man. Uh, give or take. And, yeah. and so it's mentioned a bunch in there. Or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and my question is this, and this has been something that I, I, and I've been guilty of this too. We call we're calling out the establishment Republicans and I, I don't really pull any punches regardless. If I disagree with somebody, we're going to talk about it. Uh, but I'm going into the election here. I'm like, man, do, do I need to kind of wind that back? Do we need to kind of all be on the same team here as we're trying to save America? And I, and I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on this? Do you, do you feel like that this internal civil war that's going on in the Republican Party in state with you and Mike, who is now the leader of the GOP, uh, coincidentally, uh, do, do you think this is good or bad? Or well, what, what do I you hope say, to get out of this? Yeah, what I would say is my, my whole purpose was to just tell the truth about what happened, period. Yeah. And so I, I thought it was important because there was a large amount of taxpayer money wrapped up in this whole thing to tell people the truth about everything that went on. Uh, So I'll say this, going back to early 2020, I was very frustrated with Mike because of a press release that he put out. So so if we're if we're going straight to the heart of that question, well, why create this disagreement? I did not create the disagreement. The disagreement began with a press release that came from Mike back in February 2020. So back back then I had I had briefed Mike on this case that, that we had coming up. Um, I sent uh, the the case file that we had also to the DA who, as you all know, local DAs are are a bit faster than the federal government at processing a case and and getting an indictment. So so we we went to the local DA, got six indictments, which effectively cut off the flow of of welfare money. We made those arrests, gave the case file over to the feds, the FBI, so that they could fully investigate the case as well. And, And at that same time, Hearst pushed out a press release, which was not true. So he said that I I found out about this case from the media, just like everybody else, which was just flat out not true. And I told Mike that that was not true. He later he later even contradicted himself in that press release. So so really part of the purpose of talking about what happened was to set the record straight for the public because it was easy to be misled by that initial press release. Now, let me let me take one step back and go back to your your bigger picture question, which is, you know, do we need to be having a civil war inside the conservative movement? No, no. I think it's I think it's important to tell people the truth about what happened. That's all I've ever tried to do. And I will say this, there there's a class of politicians who really think all the time about keeping other politicians happy. Uh, and being buddies with them, keeping powerful people happy. I I do not have that luxury in my job. I do not have that luxury in my job. I'm going to tell the truth about what happened. I'm going to tell you what happened with your taxpayer money and cases involving your taxpayer money because you paid for all this welfare money. That's that that's your cash right there. So so that was really the purpose. And what my hope is is that we can we can put the facts on the table. People can read the book for themselves if they want to. If they don't want to buy it, go to the library, check it out. They can read it for themselves, decide what they think for themselves. Uh, but ultimately, when it gets down to the big picture questions of are we going to come together as a party? We can unify on policy. You know, I, Mike and I have had enough conversations 
not related to this, but about policy to know that he and I agree on a bunch of different stuff, maybe 95% of things when it comes to policy questions. So that's the real goal, you know, at the end is, is even if we disagree about what happened in the past and, and all of that, that everybody can come together for the purpose of, of winning elections later on. And I think we'll get there. And I think, I think that's where we end up at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think that's what's got to happen. And of course, and Mike's an adult, you know, he's obviously if, because I think everybody assumes you're going to make a run for governor. I know you're not on the clay. We should make any announcements, but I mean, I think that that's how it looks like from the outside looking in that you're setting yourself up to for an eventual gubernatorial run. Well, look, I would say this. I mean, if you think that it is politically convenient to tell a hard truth about a retired Hall of Fame quarterback and that that's going to set you up for a good political run, you don't <laughs> understand Mississippi politics. And I know you guys get that. Yeah. My purpose was was to tell the truth about what happened here. Y'all y'all know this is a big, complicated case, and, and it's got a lot of money in it. And frankly, I was just sick of a bunch of liberal reporters putting their spin on it, article after article. I didn't want my grandkids waking up one day and, and saying, what did Paul Paul do with all that welfare stuff? And then looking up an Anna Wolf article, to be blunt about it. I, yeah. I wanted I wanted the, the full story, the actual truth to be out there in one place. And so that's why I wrote the book. Well, we uh, can agree on that. I had yeah. my own experiences back to, you referenced some of this in the book about the audit, why you didn't go to Robert Smith, which was my former boss for a long time, actually yeah. ran his 2007 campaign. Um, the, God uh, bless you. Yeah, Jesus. It's a, then it's a lot of stories for off air. Gee, thanks. <laughs> yeah, the, hey, look, man, I was 27 then, come on. <laughs> and uh, you do a lot of things <laughs> when you're in your 20s. Um, yeah, you referenced the auditor this, when he indicted the auditors, you know, or whatever, you know, David Huggins and those guys. Oh, I before was, I was there. Before you before were out. I was yeah, yeah, you were I do there. remember that. Yeah. And, um, and then there was, uh, I'd actually left the DA's office to go to the AG's office. So I was telling you off air how I know Richie McCluskey and stuff. Yeah. And, um, and then he, he attempted to indict me and, and another uh, assistant attorney general at the time. And it was a big, huge, you know, to do. And Anna Wolf wrote articles about that that made us seem like we were all guilty. Mm -hmm. And then it came out where the guy that they actually, you know, the, the subject of the whole thing, this was actually a dope dealer named Chris Butler was um, on video packing his dope and all the whole thing got blown up. And it was just, so I, when I, I read that portion of your book and I did identify with that yeah. because I'd actually experienced it personally. So um, hold that so. thought. We, we, we got to take a break. We're going to keep talking uh, through the break on the live stream. So if you guys are uh, where you can pull up the save JXN Facebook, YouTube, or X account, uh, check it out. We're going to continue this conversation during the break, and we'll be back here in about four minutes live on the radio as well. We got Shad White, state auditor, here in the office, as well as Sean York, Ron, and myself, Clay Edwards. We will be right back. There's a five second delay, is yeah, and I just do a I hard count on it instead of it. counting it out loud. Where yeah. mics are live right now. The mics are live. We're, we're, uh, I, I wanted, I wanted, okay. continue, I wanted to kind of put a button on this. I know that's uh, not fair for the radio people, but yeah. maybe it'll drive them no, to. Keep uh, coming. Yeah. So, Shad, what I was thinking, why, why I asked it like that, and, and you brought up the great point for me on uh, you not being politically advantageous to go after Brett Favre. And, and I guess my question is, or my thought process, and what I've been saying on the radio is it, it feels like, you know, you're, 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 obviously alienating, you know, the minorities with the DEI stuff. Um, at least that's the way the media is going to portray that. They right? will portray it that way. And yeah. then you feel like you're alienating, you know, blue collar uh, Bubba, you know, with the, with the Brett Favre stuff. I disagree, uh, I, man. I talked to a lot of blue collar Bubba's yeah. who tell me, look, you need to tell the truth about where my money went. Yeah. And, and a lot of guys can go out there and love, you know, their memories of Brett Favre on the football field. But that doesn't mean that they think that, you know, this stuff didn't happen. Uh, that's that's far more likely the comment I get when I'm walking up the, and down the aisles at Walmart. Um, there is I will say this there again, there's a class of politicians in particular who really want to be buddies with celebrity athletes. And I just am not in that group. Yeah. I just don't think about it that way. No, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we, we talked about that on the radio. Well, I was like, I wonder because we're in the bubble. You know, we, yeah. we can, this is what we, 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 we're hearing it from a different crew of people. We're not, I'm not getting out and talking to uh, uh, average Joe at the dinner table yeah. about this con this particular topic. Yeah. And I did bring that up. I said, I wonder if to the public, do your general public, do they see it as you protecting their money yeah. more so than you going after Brett? Favre? I think people understand that the truth can be very uncomfortable to tell. And I, I was listening to y'all on the way in too. And, and Clay, you made this point about why people like Trump. Why do people like Trump? He tells the truth. You know, he's got rough edges and he tells the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so so I think that people are hungry for that. And when I go out there and I say, look, I'm not 
I'm not trying to build this up to be more than it is or downgrade it to be less than it is, but here are the text messages that were sent and here's where the money went. Your normal person, they want to know that stuff. They yeah. want to know that stuff. And I get out and I travel, like I, I go speak at, you know, the Rotary in Vicksburg and I'll go speak to the, the Coffee Clatch and Picayune. And that's the comment that I get most frequently. It's, we have been waiting for somebody to tell us the unvarnished truth about all the waste, all the corruption, all of the problems in state government in general. Well, th that was, you know, we actually did a little live stream on Friday. And we talked about Brett Favre and uh, I don't know what Brett did or didn't do. I've read about it, you know, and so I'm not making. Any, but one thing I will say regarding text message you just brought up, he does have a text in there. And this is me, my, my prosecutor had on sure. where he says, do we get John Davis a raptor? if that's legal well to me that's such a stupid question that it's obviously illegal that i don't know how you could not see that as something that would be illegal like what you and that that's what kind of confused me that he would make that kind of statement where let's just get let's go get the guy a raptor for giving us this money like how did he not think that wasn't that wouldn't or that wouldn't have been illegal maybe he'll come on the show and, <laughs> and answer that I, question i, I really am not going to i cannot yeah. speak to that sure, he's yeah. he's suing me for defamation oh, gotcha. yeah, right, right now right. so i'm i'm just going to speak to mm. the facts and people can speculate or or have their own opinions about what those facts actually mean for him or for anybody else well i mean it's just like me saying hey clay let's go um you know rob the gas station next door because we like the sausage biscuits there if that's legal i mean it's ridiculous you know in my mind it's ridiculous to me to make that statement with you mm. anybody anybody you don't need legal training to know that's not legal is my point we're, we're, we're about 10 seconds away from being back all right man that's the kind of content y'all get when you watch online through the breaks <laughs> there good stuff there yeah sean when we come back i'm gonna let you lead uh okay. some of your questions I'm doing ad read real quick testosterone no yeah i sure think so <laughs> that's I that's what you got going uh, Welcome back in to the Clay Edwards Show here with Sean Yorkaron and State Auditor Shad White. Real quick, before we get back to the Q&A, well, I'll tell you what, actually, we've only got a minute before the top of the hour break. We will save the ad read for the next hour. Uh, Sean, if you got something, uh, two minutes or less, hit Shad with it. Uh, well, I think, you know, what I got is going to be a little bit longer. I'm going to wait that till the, uh, the top of the thing, you know. But I will say this as to what we did talk about. And I know Shad can't, you know, he's getting sued for that. But there's, you know, tacking off the Brett Favre stuff. You know, there's been, um, I saw the Charlie Kirk segment and stuff where, um, you know, he said, I think Kirk said something like Favre's a hero. It, it doesn't seem to me, and this is me, this is not Shad saying or Clyde saying it. It doesn't seem to me that Favre is a hero in any of this. Um, you know, he obviously felt that he did something wrong. He wouldn't give him the money back. And, I thought uh, that was a poor choice of words on Charlie's part. I, I, mean, that, I, I thought, calling him a hero if I'm... Yeah, I mean, and then, you know, the suggestion of, of, of giving a director of DHS a raptor for, you know, funneling money to me seems like an, an obviously illegal act suggestion. I, I know they didn't go through with it. So, I mean, I think there was some, some certainly some malice there somewhere. And uh, so the, the calling him, I wouldn't call him a hero either. I, I thought that was just a, not the right way to put it. So. Yeah. And, and your opinion, Sean, is that it's almost an admission of guilt when you ask if you can uh, give somebody a raptor. I mean, I just don't know any other way to look at that. Like, you know, I just, if you're going to, you're talking about a public official who's, who's giving you money and you're going to give them a gift. <laughs> Like you're whatever I mean, it's a bribe. Let's put it. Let's call it what it is. And, and to be clear, he has not been charged with a crime. No. To be clear, he's no. not been charged with. A crime. No, 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 no. And this again, this is me saying this. I just think that you know you don't have to be a lawyer to know that you can't do that. Yeah, and I think it's quite obvious. So. When we, when we come back, we got ten seconds. When we come back, I do want to I do want to circle back to the uh, the federal investigation part part and, and and get you to clear up like Mike's side of that argument there about uh, time and sure. and effort. We'll be sure. right back with Shad White on the uh, Clay Edwards Show. Sunday, 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 October 6th for the annual Rankin County Bucking Bronc Bash. That's right. It's that time of the year again. This Sunday, October 6th. Hey, this thing's way more than just a rodeo. It's a wild ride for a great cause. There's going to be thrills such as bareback riding, saddle bronc, barrel racing, and of course, everybody's favorite, bull riding. There's going to be fun for the kiddos and fans alike. The gates fling open at 1230. The show kicks off at 2 p.m. That's this Sunday, October 6th. Hey, it's only $12 to get in. Kids under 10 get in for free. Head on down to 122 Justin Drive in Pillahatchie, Mississippi. Or you got more questions, dash on over to Facebook. Type in Rankin County Buck and Bronc Bash, and the event page is going to pop right up there for you with all the details. Yee-haw, let's help out with a great cause 
Wally Hooten and hollering. Hey, look, on a serious note, this is benefiting my good friends down at the Leesburg Volunteer Fire Department and the ever-reaching community outreach group based in Pillahatchie there. Don't meet me there. Beat me there for the annual Rankin County Buckin Bronc Bash this Sunday at 122 Justin Drive in Pillahatchie, Mississippi. Boom, shakalaka boom. We're back. It's hour three of the Clay Edwards Show today. I hadn't done three hours in a while. I want to thank Mike Madison for allowing us to borrow his hour today. Mike will be back tomorrow, uh, Thursday, and, of course, he'll be back next Wednesday as well. This is just a one-week foray into his hour so we could uh, make the time to interview the state auditor here for longer than 30 minutes. So uh, we appreciate Shad coming in. We appreciate Mike Madison letting us borrow his hour and uh, uh, the station manager for uh, signing off on all of that as well. Real quick, guys, uh, are you suffering from low testosterone? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people uh, in my comments that are suffering from low testosterone. I can tell you, um, if, <laughs> if you're diagnosed on the radio, diagnosed on the radio, <laughs> look, man, if you're suffering from fatigue, decreased muscle tone, lack of energy, low libido, just ask your wife if you're suffering from low libido. She'll tell you uh, brain fog or sleep disturbances. Uh, man, you could be suffering from symptoms of low testosterone. Uh, the text line is they're, they're changing numbers. So there's no text line to text my name to just go to men's health ms.com men's health ms.com that's men's health in mississippi located at 120 fountains boulevard uh give them a call let them know you heard it on the clay edwards show and go get your free testosterone screening courtesy of the clay edwards show what's the worst what's the worst that happens you find out you don't need testosterone you find out you need some your life gets better that's a win 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 in my book uh if you got if you need to lose a bunch of extra weight uh try the uh and ozempic's very expensive your insurance probably ain't gonna cover that how about compounded semaglutide for pennies on the dollar compared to what uh, a month of Ozempic costs? They offer that there at Men's Health in Mississippi as well. Check them out today, menshealthms.com. All right, we got a man that is not lacking testosterone here, uh, a man that has no fear. I'll give him that <laughs> here in the studio, Mr. Shad White, uh, state auditor. Shad, again, thank you for coming on this morning. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, we got Sean Yurkron, former 10-year prosecutor at Hines County DA's office. Um, we don't talk about that enough, but um, but Sean spent a lot of time down there and uh, prosecuted the fortunately, only, unfortunately, you know, got the only death penalty in the st in the in the in the county in, in what the last twenty years, something like that. No yeah, way, huh. good stuff there. Um, well, good stuff because when you 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 f around, you find out around here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, fool around and find fool out. around, fool around yeah, the around church here. version, the church version, absolutely. Uh, you're yeah. welcome to use that for any campaigning you want to do in the future. I'll um, use the church version. <laughs> the church version. Um, look, man, we got Shad White in here. Sean's got some questions for Shad. I hadn't quit running my mouth since I got here, uh, so I'm gonna pass the mic over to my co-host, Mr. Sean Yorkron. Um, you know, I've read Shad some portions of the book where you talk, and I, I experienced this. You know, Clay just talked about some of my experience there, and uh, you know about the feds moving slowly. And I mm -hmm. think that's kind of the joke in the prosecutor community. It's like, when are the feds going to do something? You know, we kind of have to deal with that on the state level. Yep. It's something that I you know experienced a lot. The question I did have about it though is, I know how functionally how a county DA's office works, and mm -hmm. it's set up very well to prosecute street crimes, murder rom robbery drug crimes those kinds of things it doesn't generally do large complex financial crimes it's not something that a county da's office generally does and you know being as familiar with Hines county as i am it's just something we ever did you know on a grand scale why did you why did you want to take it to jody owens who at that time was just speed speed, speed. i mean that that's the bottom line is that we we were investigating the the welfare scandal through the last half of 2019 in december of 2019 DHS, the Department of Human Services, released an intent to award letter, which is a, a letter saying we're about to give a bunch of additional money to these same people who were stealing the money. And so my thought was, well, we're either going to put a stop to this and, and prevent them from spending that money on folks who are stealing it, or we're just going to hope that uh that one day maybe the money gets clawed back if these folks go to jail two or three years from now and and frankly if i had just taken it to the feds alone and said hey y'all have at it i'm not giving this to anybody else and uh you let me know when you're ready to prosecute it would have taken them a long time the feds took a, another year to really get engaged after we did give it to the feds mm. say so it would have taken them a long time that money would have gone out the door 
and you would be talking to former state auditor Shad White sitting here because the press would have never let me live down the fact that I could have also taken this to the local DA and put a stop to that. It would have been the end of my career because that would have been a huge, huge mistake. So instead, what we did is we take it to the DA and we gave it to the FBI and gave it to the attorney general's office. And of course, the DA is going to move faster. I'll, I'll respectfully disagree with you about the white collar cases. Most of the cases that we have successfully uh, led to a conclusion in my time as state auditor have gone through the local DA's offices around the state. So they just in general are faster. And, and but, we assess every DA's office differently. We, we ask tough questions about whether or not they can handle the case. And in this particular instance, they handled it. Mm -hmm. So they indicted six people, we arrested six people, and they got five of six convictions. The lowest level person was the one that was not convicted out of those six people. So, so they did their job very, very effectively at the end of the day, and it cut off the flow of funds. And also, just remember, and also the feds got to look at this too. They got the full case file in early February 2020, and, and they were able to look at it, have been able to look at it for the last four years and change and mm -hmm. do their own work on this. Well, and you, you mentioned that your office, I know your office gives cases to the, the local DA's offices because sure. I had to prosecute some of them too when I was there during my time. But that's involving the theft of county money. Is that correct? No, not uh, always. State, uh, no. Is it involving the theft of large sums of federal money? Yeah, it could be federal money. It could be state money. It could be any of that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Have you ever, I mean, obviously this is the biggest federal theft case that's been in the history of the state. What, is there another one that you can cite as an example that went to a DA's office? Like another well, theft of federal, federal money? If this is the biggest, the, the no. Short or, I don't mean like, no. I don't mean like one is large, but just another example of a federal theft of federal money. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, we've had we've had multiple cases uh, involving unemployment compensation, which is just kind of a mix of of state you know, and uh, and federal funds. Oftentimes uh, we've had cases involving um, uh, a workforce training dollars, which sometimes come down and get mixed. Uh, federal dollars get mixed with state dollars. And so that's kind of a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Had Medicaid cases uh, that we're working right now. So that's a mix of state and federal dollars. There's a bunch of those kinds of cases. There's nothing as large as this because this sure. is like. It's like saying, well, is there another football team better than Alabama? Well, right. They're number one or whatever. Who's ever number one? Whoever is number one right now, Texas. Um, but anyway, that's that's the short answer. Yeah. OK. Um, does, now, let me ask you on the front end of it, though. Could you have gone to um, Mike Hurst and Jody at the same time and just had a meeting? Because we did that back when we were um, prosecuting. If you heard the case of James Craig Anderson, he was a black guy that was went over by Daryl Deadman. Uh, yeah. about 11, 12 years ago. And yeah. we worked in conjunction with them because they could prosecute things that we couldn't and get defendants that we couldn't based on the state laws that we had. Um, did you, did, why didn't you do that from the beginning? So, so basically that is what we did, right? Okay. I go to Mike and I brief him on what we're about to do. And I told him, I said, you know, we're, we're also going to take this to Jody. Jody is going to end up being the first mover here because he can move faster than you can. But you guys are going to get to look at the whole thing and you're going to get to investigate it. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, within days of that initial indictment, the FBI has got the full file. They spend the next year looking at it without really doing anything. And then eventually a year later, they do come in and they start moving. They seized a home about a year later. And then they, they eventually started. Uh, Teddy DiBiase's home. Yeah, right? yeah. Junior, junior. Yeah, Junior. Um, and then they started with their own indictments after mm -hmm. that. So so look, the, the truth of the matter is everybody had a fair bite at this apple. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the only way we were going to be able to guarantee to the public that and show to the public that this case had been fully investigated, that everybody had had gotten to look at this and had a shot to prosecute whatever they could. So the FBI was aware once they were already died on the state level. Is that what you're saying? Or yes, but the, but Mike was aware before that. Before yeah. before you guys actually took it to the grand jury. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and also, I would say this: Mike on his own did a meeting uh, apparently with. I guess Nancy knew. Mm -hmm. I've never been told what happened in that meeting. But from that moment on, you know, when somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm being investigated for welfare fraud, right. you know, that might be a sign <laughs> that you need to open an investigative file that day, maybe. So uh, so again, if the if the feds wanted to run with this and, and run and gun on that, they, they should have started from that moment right then and there. Um, it, it took us coming in and saying, here's the here's the stuff that we have dug up. And we're going to take it to the DA and also the feds are going to get their shot to look at it. And the AG's office is going to get their shot to look at it. We'll see what they do too. Oh, did you meet with them too? The AG's officer? Yeah. So I'm, I met with the AG's office. They, I'll just be blunt about it. They expressed no real interest in looking at the evidence at all. Um, so eventually 
we took the evidence file over to them and mm -hmm. put it in their hand, even though they had not asked for it. Because at some point so, I was like, you know, you guys, even if you don't want to see this, I am not going to be one of these go along to get along guys where we just, you know, I, I, I'm comfortable with you just putting your head in the sand mm -hmm. and ignoring the situation. I'm giving you the evidence file so that you, you have to admit that you have it. Period. Yeah, I, plausible I, deniability on your end there. I guess that was a well good, on their end, right? Yeah. I mean, they wanted to say, "Yeah, oh well, we haven't seen the evidence file." Well, you hadn't asked for it, but guess what? You're going to get it anyway. I guess that was kind of the confusion. We, you know, we had Mike on, obviously, and he talked about when they were made aware of it. I read your book too about when you guys had a breakfast at Primos or something yep. like that. I think it was okay. And so this was so you you went to Jody first to go over it. And then to Mike, is that the chronology there? I'm getting that right. It's it's about the same time. And we're talking about within a matter of days when those two. Okay. Meetings happen. And this is all again, before you ever take it to the grand jury or anything correct. like that. Yep, just, just clarity for the audience. Yep. I think that's the confusion. Yep. Um, so Mike could have, you're saying, could have taken it and run with it at that point. Same he could have taken it and run with it when he had his earlier meeting with Nancy New without mm -hmm. me being in there. I, I didn't even know about that meeting at the time. So that's the moment at which you're you're alerted as a federal investigator or a federal mm -hmm. prosecutor. Hey, you can run and gun with this thing if you want to. Okay. You now, I, I think that the meeting, if my memory, jogging my memory here, the meeting with Nancy New that Mike had, I think in the book, it gets portrayed like it was a kind of a clandestine meeting and it was kind of off the record where Mike kind of cleared it up, at least in my opinion, and said it was way more on the record and it, there were other eight their FBI was involved and other people were involved in that in that meeting. And uh, do you want to clear that up? At that all? would be that would have been helpful to know at the time. Yeah. I mean, when when I as a colleague come to you and say, hey, we're, we're investigating this big thing, um, you know, I, it would be good to not hear in that moment. Oh, yeah, we've already met with that person. Like Maybe you should have told me that earlier mm -hmm. when that person came to you and, and I guess said that they were being investigated by the state auditor's office. So. Um, you know, that that's that's the frustrating part of this is that like a little more communication from his end would have been helpful. And, and then, frankly, uh, him him putting out that press release right when we made the arrest, that was also not helpful. That's not what you do to a colleague in law enforcement. I mean, can you imagine if you had indicted somebody in the Hines County DA's office? And then, you know, the sheriff of Rankin County came in behind you and been like, well, I don't know what those yahoos are doing over there. And, and they don't really know what they're doing. That sets you up for an acquittal. That, that's, that puts you in a terrible, terrible position. That's not what law enforcement colleagues do to one another. Uh, so anyway, that, that was some of my frustration during that period. So in that press release you're talking about, he says that he was never aware of the indictments. Is that right? I think. Is it uh, we'd have to read it to go back? But <laughs> but what he said is something to the effect of I found out about this in the media, just like everybody else. OK, man. But you're and again, you've said already several times that he knew about it and he could have done some just days after you'd gone to Jody about even investigating the thing. Correct. Okay. Yes. Or before that, whenever that meeting was with Nancy. Newton. Well, that clears. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I, yeah. I was confused uh, about the uh, you know chronology, the whole thing. I sure. You, you know, reading it, it sounded like you had just met with Jody and then met with Mike later. You know, and, and, and apologies to anybody who's listening who has not read the book. Yeah, they're probably we're all completely, deep in your book. completely right. lost at this point. Yeah, I would say I'm if sorry. you don't want to buy it, just go to the library and pick it up and read the first few <laughs> chapters. And then you'll be like, OK, now I know what they're talking about. But yes. Mm -hmm. OK, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's a, that's the thing we're trying to set up. So because, you know, generally like if you, you would when we were all when I was four years ago, you know, me and we've got a whole little prosecutors club to talk about these things. And um, we we're like, you know, why didn't he go to the U.S. attorney's office instead of go to Jody Owens, who's just been D.A. for like a month and a half and yeah. has never been a prosecutor before. So that was a confusion that we all kind of speed. Had. Yeah, if I had if I had if I had only gone to the feds, I would not be in this job anymore. Mm -hmm. Speed. So, uh, so I know j just to put a button on this particular mm -hmm. topic here, I know Mike Mike's what he said on the show that day was that uh he called you to meet when he found out from others the investigation was was going on versus the other way around yeah so well look i mean that's fine yeah like we we had breakfast regularly during that period that was not unusual and i obviously based on you know the the look back at all of this i obviously was going to take this to everybody sure yeah mm -hmm. period sure. the right. um the only other thing uh now at this stage john davis and nancy new i'll use them they um they pled guilty in federal court before state court is that right John pled guilty, ple pleaded guilty in federal court, then came to state court, mm -hmm. um, and Nancy did the same. Yeah, I believe that's and right. that's post Mike Hurst era. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, um, Darren Lamarco was the U.S. attorney during that. Period. And and the first conviction that Hines County got was actually on Brett DiBiase. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think that's right. Yep, okay. that's right. Yep, and then Anne McGrew after that.
All right. Okay. So they they actually got the first two convictions, and then the feds kind of got the big one kind of tacking off what Hines is doing is kind of the way I'm reading this. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was almost simultaneous. Like John, John Davis, I believe pleaded guilty in federal court in the morning and then in the afternoon to state charges. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, that's it's very bang, right. bang. Yeah. They had a good day at the office then. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, it was a wild day at the office. Let's, uh, let's take our last break here with Shad. Come back for uh, one last segment. This is the Clayton show with uh, Shad White, state auditor and Sean Yorkron. We'll be right back on W Y A into the clay edwards show here live we got this last segment here with state auditor shad white and sean yorkron and myself here in the clay edwards show.com studios we'll call it that if somebody wants to sponsor it it's the clay show.com studios um shad let's fast forward a little bit or not fast forward change topics somewhat let's talk about the that the, the book kind of the nexus of the book because I, I did see the other day and i know you, you can't say much because pending litigation but uh, i guess brett suing you basically you feel like you're, you're you're profiting on his name and and slandering him at the same time is that how i understand that uh i'd say you could read the read the motion that they filed friday night but uh, a defamation case is, is suing somebody for saying a thing yeah. that you believe is damaging it's it doesn't have to do with the the profiting part and look let me just say this too um these defamation suits are incredibly frivolous they have put my family through a very, very difficult time because I, I now have to pay for my lawyer out of Shad's pocket just for telling the truth to you, the taxpayer. And, and so the the advance I got on the book, the, the money that I got paid to do the advance on the book was one third, about one third of the first legal bill, my first personal legal bill that I got. Not all the legal bills, yeah. the first one that I got. So anyway, this these last few years have been very, very difficult dealing with this kind of stuff. But look, I, I knew going into this job that telling the truth was more important than any of the personal costs that I would pay. So that that's why I'm willing to do it. And, and frankly, I mean, this, this may sound hokey, but it is just true. I have three kids. I look at my kids and I ask myself, am I doing my job in a way that would make them proud of me one day? And also, Am I using my time in this position to make Mississippi the place it can be so that they want to live here one day? Am I doing what I can do to make Mississippi strong so that they will want to be Mississippi residents for the rest of their lives? So that, that's why I'm doing this. That's that's what motivates me. And, and I'm willing to blaze through these the personal difficulties and the personal financial costs in order to get to that goal. Let, let me ask this about, uh, I believe you can answer this about the Brett Favre stuff. What is it that he allegedly did wrong? Was it just not, is it not paying the money back? Did he, he got paid to do these speeches? Did, did COVID not affect those speeches not getting done? Um, Cause like, again, I know he had to pay the money this back. Pre COVID. All that was pre COVID. Pre -COVID. Okay. Yeah. My timeline was a little off there. So that explains that. So I looked at it kind of like this, but is it kind of like when a Ponzi scheme goes down and somebody unknowingly illegally gains money, like the New York Mets, for example, made a bunch of money off the Bernie Madoff stuff. Mm. There were some of the people that didn't get ripped off. They, they profited wildly from it, but unknowingly that it was ill-gotten gains. They had to pay all that back. Is is that kind of the similar case here with Brett or is his because he did not do the speeches? Well, I'll just, I'll just say as plainly as I can say what happened, just so people know. So number one, the, the, the point to remember at the beginning is that he's not been charged with a crime, period. So I'll say that at the outset. If you go back and look, you know, what what we saw in the audit documents was that Farve Enterprises was paid one point one million dollars. When you dig into uh, the contract that justified that payment, the contract required him to go give certain speeches and do certain things. When we asked if those things had been done, meaning we, we asked uh, the news if those things had been done, they said, oh, yeah, here are the events and listed out events and dates. We dug into those events and realized that Mr. Favre was not at those events, which I believe he has now acknowledged himself, too. So the dollars have gone out the door to pay for events where the contract was not complied with. So, again, it's money that went out the door uh, and has to be paid back by somebody, period. So there's that piece. And then when you dig into the text messages, you see text messages where he is clearly saying to the other people, can we keep this confidential the way I'm being paid? He is acknowledging that this is state money 
that should be going to folks who are in shelters. That's the word he uses, shelters. And, and y'all can read the text messages there out there yeah, for the public. I've to read see. them before. Yeah. So those those are the core facts. Those mm-hmm. are the core facts. And people, again, can draw their own conclusions about how much blame to put on this person or that person or, or whatever. They can draw their own conclusions. My my goal was to tell people the truth about what happened. And there's some folks who didn't want me to do that. There's some folks who are get who get uncomfortable hearing that, but it is just the truth. You know, that that's the blunt truth. And I think that if you're in a job like mine, if you're not willing to tell the truth, you better go find a different job. Yeah. You got to go find a different job. Didn't we? I mean, speaking of that, the, uh, I was speaking to a I'll give it a shout, front office sports, you know, the, uh, I think it was AJ Perez kind of informed me about John Van Lanningham or Dr. Van Lanningham. Jacob Van Lanningham. Jacob Van Lanningham. Yep. Okay. And he, uh, he's just pled guilty in federal court. Is that correct? correct. Yes. And that was in July. Um, and that he's the one that's related to Brett and the Prevacus stuff. Is that also correct? He he was the head of Prevacus. Jacob okay. Van Lanningham was. Yeah. As a, for folks who have not followed the story, that's a company that was, uh, was developing, according to them, an experimental concussion treatment. And Van Lanningham was the, the doctor at the head of it, who's now pleaded guilty to federal wire fraud charges. And then in relation to the welfare scandals correct okay. yeah and in, in relation to that money that went to Prevacus, yes okay and um it's, it, the way i've and i don't know this but i mean i assume that that so their investigation relating to that and far is still ongoing the fbi I would think well what i would say is that we have not been asked a meaningful question about the case in probably a year mm-hmm. by the fbi so it, it's possible i don't know it's okay. possible that they finished their investigation long ago. Mm-hmm. That's what the that's what it, I, I would take away from gotcha. our interactions. And that what's going on right now is that prosecutors are trying to figure out who, if anyone else, they want to charge. Mm-hmm. That's where I think they probably are. Well, because seeing Van Lanning him when I was notified about that this summer, it seems like the thought process would be like, is this going to lead to far if they've got him? I know you don't know and can't answer that. And I can't answer that either. But it seems like it may be possibly heading that direction. No idea. No, I know. no idea. <laughs> no, right. But let me let me ask you this. One of the things that's been brought up a bunch is that a lot of people feel like the book doing the book for what is considered still an ongoing investigation is a bad idea. What would you I'm sure you've heard that. How would you yeah, respond to it's that? just not an ongoing investigation. I mean, we we have not done work on this in years and we haven't been asked a meaningful question by the FBI in in at least a year. And you've gotten your state convictions. Yeah. You know. So so 100 uh, percent. So really, again, this case is is one of those cases where the facts have been dug up. I mean, my goodness, we are over four and a half years since the first arrests, over five years since we actually started investigating it, we're, we're bumping up on the statute of limitations on almost every single act, if not, if not already crossing the statute of limitations on almost every single act. So the investigations piece is done unless some new fact pops up today that we just like have, have totally not been told some new witness comes in the door. Um, the, the question is just between now and when all of the statutes eventually run, are the feds or any other prosecutor, are they going to prosecute anybody else? So this is this is actually an ideal time to get all these facts out there so that people can understand what happened to their money. Um, and, and for somebody, somebody told me the other day, said, well, you know, uh, you should have waited for all this case, all these cases to go all the way up to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, including the civil cases. I'm like, man, that that is not the way any of these stories unfold. Like, yeah. There was a mountain of stuff written about Enron before the Supreme Court finally adjudicated all of that. Uh, the public needs to know about this stuff before it's 15 years down the road. Like this is their money. They deserve a little more urgency than that. And we do live in an internet age too, where it, where information is now we're in the information age. Yeah. And it's like, I can definitely hearing you say it like that. I can, I can rationalize that. Cause I was probably one of the people in the camp, just listening mm-hmm. to people that I trust saying, Oh, this was in bad taste to do it. But then you, you hear you say it like that. It's like, you know what, man, People can go find all this information independently anyway. Yes. I don't yeah. think you put anything in there that wasn't public so, record. So, so one thing one thing to bear in mind, too, is that this book at its core is a book about corruption in state government. So am I surprised that a bunch of political insiders in Jackson are suddenly mad that somebody wrote a book about corruption in state government? No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I mean, th- a lot of people got uncomfortable just because the word lobbying was in there. And like, you're going to have to get over it because this stuff is the truth. And yeah, I get that it, 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 you know, ruffles a few feathers, but this is important because this is other people's money. It's important for folks to know what happened here. Um, and speaking of the, uh, actually 
you know, the end of the investigation, there's still the sentencing is not over because I guess New and Davis have not been sentenced in federal or state court yet. Almost so. nobody has been sentenced. And that's, isn't that interesting though? It's been because I looked at the sentencing order yesterday and it was September 22nd of 2022. So, so you got you so know, what I have been ago. told is that you know there's still one person that they have indicted who has who is pleading not guilty, and that's Teddy DiBiase Jr. Yeah. And so there, uh, you know, speaking probably from your prosecutor experience, you could say this in general. You probably don't want to sentence anybody until you feel like all of the litigation is done. True. Right. Yeah. So that I assume that that's kind of what they're waiting on is for that eventual case to play out. Mm -hmm. OK. And then just all kind of do them if they do them at the same time. All at once, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I mean, we used to do that a lot with, uh, you know, especially if you had a, a situation like this, you had a cooperating co-defendant and you'd make a plea deal with them. You'd have them plead guilty, but you wouldn't sentence them yet until after they testify correct and that's the way you know the way you do things exactly that way so right. that, yeah so if that's something similar speaking and, in general that is in exactly general right. i know you're not saying it, but like I, if, if they have a cooperating co-defendant they're waiting then yeah so makes yep. sense to me so. shad white thank you so much for taking the time Come thank on, you all for clearing that up a little bit man yeah. uh would love to have you back love to sit down and do long form sometime uh sean thank you yep. shad white thank you let's do it after the election let's do it <laughs> talk a little yeah, politics uh yep. who you got Oh, I'm a Trump guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm crossing my fingers and praying for our country that Trump wins uh, and that the people of Pennsylvania will have a little common sense on Election Day. Oh, man, we shall see. <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously Team Trump over here. All right, Shad White, thank you so much. Guys, we'll be right back. Sean and I got one more segment to go before we get out of here today. This is The Clay Edwards Show.